it's as affordable and accessible as a Dacia Sandero, but it's as charming and as robust and as versatile as a Land Rover Defender. As you can see, I'm on a very different bike today. Today, I'm riding the Himalayan. This is actually my dad's bike. Um, as you all know, I've got an Interceptor 650 myself. And I thought, why not swap for a little while and just see how I enjoy the Himalayan. But obviously the big question for anyone coming down in power, so an Interceptor has 47 horsepower, whereas this has about, I think, 24 or something along those lines. And the big question when you're coming down in power is, is it going to have enough power? Um, for everything I need it for. Well, that's the question on most people's lips anyway. Seems to be the thing people talk about most when they talk about the Himalayan. I think everyone appreciates that it's this little rugged, utilitarian, dual sport type machine that can really kind of go anywhere and, and do anything. But everyone seems to have reservations about the, the lack of power. And I won't lie, you obviously notice a lack of power when you're coming down the power band from something a bit more powerful, but I think that's true of any bike. Now if you were on a 250 and jumped onto a 125, you would notice the same difference. If you're jumping off of a litre bike onto a 650, you'll notice that as well. So a lot of it really is just down to the, the comparison and a lot of it's down to your perspective. Uh, but when we're talking about does something have enough power, I think what we tend to mean is, can I, can I do everything on it? Can I ride on all types of roads? Could it be my only bike? and get me everywhere I need it to go. And for that to be true, you really need something that's going to get you up to maximum road legal speeds so that you can keep up and stay safe in any sort of traffic. So we're talking in the UK about 70 miles per hour. As long as the bike can get you up to 70 miles per hour at a decent pace and you can keep up with traffic, then it's, then it's fast enough. Now is it fast enough to be thrilling, to have thrill and acceleration? That's a completely different question and that really depends on what you're looking for and a bike. If you're somebody who tends to grip the throttle and rip it every single time you're out and you want to be doing 100 miles per hour, of course this is not the bike for you. If you're someone who uses a bike as a primary mode of transport, somebody who likes to get out and just go for nice long rides, sees it more as a, as a relaxation technique, this might be the bike for you. So what I'm doing first of all, just to try and alleviate any concerns about its ability to go anywhere, do anything and be, you know, your only one bike, is I'm going to jump on the motorway. Something that I don't do very often on my bike. Boring! You can see I've got enough here to get up to 70, past this guy who's probably doing about 60 in the inside lane. And I'm sitting at 70, perfectly happy, cruising along in the outside lane. You know, the bike is revving up there at five and a half, almost 6,000 revs. But it doesn't feel like it's got any issue with doing that. It's not like I'm having to keep the throttle absolutely pinned to stay at 70. I've still got a little bit in reserve here if I want to twist a bit more and get up to 75 if I want to. Now I will say this is a, a Euro 4 Himalayan, uh, not the Euro 5. I know there's some differences of course in the, in the models, some of those being cosmetic, a few minor upgrades here and there in the Euro 5 and the two bikes are probably very comparable. Now this one obviously has been well run in at this point. Um, it's got 1,651 miles on it, um, so still a long way to go till you consider it, you know, a fully run in bike. But it's gone through its run in period. It's had the revs kept low. It's had its services done, and it runs really, really well. But look at this. I'm even overtaking in the motorway. So it's 72, 74, 75 miles per hour. Indicated, of course, I know legally I'm probably not speeding right now. This is probably more realistic that I'm actually doing about 70 right now with 75 on the clock. Maybe 71 or 72. And you know what? With the little screen here, the ergonomics of this bike, you can see I'm riding along here one handed and I'm just cruising along and it's perfectly happy doing this. And it's actually a really comfortable bike to do it on. There's not a lot of wind blasts. But I think we've proven in that little stretch there that this bike is absolutely something that you could do a bit of motorway miles on if you were commuting, maybe some mini touring, 
Would I want to take it across Europe and sit on motorways through all that journey at 70, 80 miles an hour constantly? Probably not, because it's going to be right up there in the rev range most of its life and you're going to want something that's got a bit more to give probably so that you're not stressing the engine. However, can you do long tours without sitting at 70, 80 on motorways all the time? Of course you can. So it could easily be a touring bike as well. And I think that little stretch of road has proved that the bike is perfectly adequate as an all-round bike if we talk about the higher end of being able to do fast motorway speeds. Now if you're living somewhere, perhaps in the US, where motorway cruising speeds are, are kind of higher up there at kind of 80 miles per hour, then maybe you're starting to push the bike to its limits, maybe it's something you want to test ride first. Certainly in the UK and on, on most, I think most countries, that 70 miles per hour tends to be that upper limit. One thing I see about the handling is, it did take me a minute to get used to now, getting used to the feeling of the front end and how much it wants to dip in to turns was a, just took me a bit of time to get used to but really 15-20 miles in I was loving it and I was starting to throw it into little bends and we'll see that on a stretch of the road up ahead where we get a bit more twisty just how well this thing can just be thrown around in the bends uh, seating position in terms of ergonomics very much upright very comfortable it's very much a standard neutral uh, seating position which is the norm of course for adventure bikes and imagine the reason for that being that it is the easiest bike uh, position to ride the bike from it's the most comfortable position to do big miles on certainly really enjoy it myself this one's got the the kind of tall screen the the hand guards fitted i think these are both standard royal enfield accessories if i remember correctly both do a great job of keeping the wind off you uh, with the gloves i'm wearing just now these are actually a kind of mesh I call these a, a spring summer glove uh, and we're into October almost here in Scotland and it is starting to get chilly it's about nine degrees outside today hands are perfectly warm wind blast has kept off my face my neck my chest I'm not feeling any wind blast at all if I'm being honest certainly when I ride in these gloves on the on the way home because I'm going to pick my interceptor up and swap them back over coming back home I will definitely be feeling the cold through my fingertips on the interceptor so these little hand guards from um, in fact I've just realised these are not Royal Enfield standard these are Tech Bike Parts so there you go so there's a little review for you on these hand guards from Tech Bike Parts doing a great job at keeping the wind off my hands and keep my hands nice and cosy don't have heated grips or anything like that so not bad at all now this route that I'm doing here is a real mix of all the types of roads that you would do if you, you know, if you needed one bike as an all-rounder, I think we're going to cover all those types of roads that you might do on this route. So we've done some motorway, we're now on some A-road, um, you know, single carriageway, national speed limit. So we're sitting here at 50 just now, we'll probably speed up to 60 later on. And then we're going to go on to some nice twisty back roads, heading out to where my parents live uh, in Dunfermline and Fife, where I'm going to swap the bikes over. What I will say is, I'm, I really enjoy this bike. I did think I was going to be more obsessed with power. Now again, you know that power is something that I've got, it's a sensitive subject for me. I think there's this, this massive spectrum of powerful bikes, all the way down to, you know, entry level 125s or even 50cc scooters. And they all have their own place. Sometimes low power bikes can be fun, but you might say, well, do you know what? Maybe not for my only bike, because you, you do want the ability to ride in all types of conditions. If you're somebody who does want to go on longer tours, somebody who wants to ride in groups, you want something that's going to be able to keep up. There's not anything that I can't do within reason. It can ride any any road in the UK, it can ride it as fast as is safely possible, which is certainly faster than is legally possible. It can keep up on group rides. Sure, I might fall behind every now and again on the odd overtake, but I can catch back up. It's perfectly happy. It can do city riding, it can do town riding, it can do back roads and twisties and it can do motorways. Now I'm twisting the throttle on just now and it's not going anywhere in a hurry. But it feels... It feels quite torquey. It feels like it's it's pulling on me. And look, how long is it really, realistically, before we get up to 60 plus miles per hour with a twist of the throttle? If you're willing to just let those couple of seconds go, we're now up at that cruising speed, I'm now cruising along here 60 plus miles per hour indicated, probably about 60 in real world terms and I'm just throwing it out of these corners and it's just absolutely brilliant fun and here we go, little overtake for you 
Right, we're out and we're back in. And again, if you're willing to let those those riskier overtakes go or the or the thrill of high acceleration, just let that go. It's a bike that could serve you very, very well for all types of riding. I mean, I'm just trying to, I'm racking my brain to think, where else are you going to get a bike at this kind of money that can do everything this one can? The only thing that I can think is probably the, the Honda CB500X. Hardcore off-roaders would say, that's not a real adventure bike, it can't do the off-road stuff, and this would be the one to go for. What I would say with the CB500X is, I think you've got an engine that can really do everything. But again, if you're willing to just think, well, actually, I don't mind backing off the throttle a little bit. I don't mind planning my overtakes a little more carefully. In fact, I don't mind just sitting cruising along with traffic because at the end of the day, there's far more to riding a motorbike than speed. There's far more fun to be had than, than just going fast. And if that's your mentality, which certainly is my mentality, then this, again, Himalayan would make an absolutely brilliant option as an only bike, as a weekend bike, as a touring bike. It's really got a lot going for it. In terms of the looks, I've always liked the Himalayan. Um, in fact, it was it was only just being launched in the UK when I was passing my test, and I was considering it as my first big bike. Um, but sadly, it, it didn't launch here in time for me to buy one. But I was a big fan of the looks. I, I love the the utilitarian, simple square lines. There's a, a sense of kind of retro about it. It's almost got a, a kind of military vibe about it. The way I started to think about it is comparing it to cars, funnily enough. Now, I'm not a big car guy. We've got a big seven-seater family car because I've got a couple of kids and I've got a dog and we've got to transport kids and dogs and stuff everywhere and it makes sense to have a nice big car. And prior to getting that, we had a, a Dacia Sandero. So I think the Dacia is probably the, the, the cheapest um, car you can buy on the market, certainly if you want five seats and five doors and whatnot. You know, when I, when I think about that Dacia Sandero, I liken it to this Himalayan quite a lot, and, I, and in many, many ways. Now, don't stop watching the video because I said that. So in the ways it is cheap to buy, it's cheap to run, it's cheap to ensure that it's got no frills, it's simple. It's very similar in those ways. But where it differs is in that character and in that look and feel and you know, and just the the overall charm of the bike. And I can actually only think of, of one car that I can liken it to. And it's really a Land Rover Defender. It's like going out and buying a Land Rover Defender, but it only costs the same as a Dacia Sandero. We've still got that simplicity, but it's a go anywhere machine. And it's cool and it's utilitarian and it, it brings your mind back to those old military vehicles, which are this what this does for me. We've just been riding some of the back roads there. You can see the bike handles itself very well. We've got an overtake in. We're doing, you know, plenty, keeping up the momentum through the corners. Handles brilliantly. It can keep its momentum up at 65, 70 miles an hour all day long. And that's the thing. When you've got loads of power or you've got a little 25 horsepower-ish engine like this, once you get up to 60 or 70 miles per hour, it's then really down to how well the bike handles and the rider skill as to how, you, how long you can keep it there at that speed and cruise quite happily. Right, if you can start to build up your skills and, and cornering so that you're not having to back off the throttle constantly, slam on the brakes and then get back on the throttle, you know, cruising through corners at 60 miles per hour, this thing is going to do an absolute brilliant job of any little touring, days out, riding, a and B roads, twisties, it's great fun. Right, so we've successfully dropped off the Himalayan and picked up the Interceptor. How did I get on with the Himalayan? You know, actually better than I thought I would. Um, and I thought I would like it, but I loved it. It was fantastic. I'm looking forward to borrowing it again. I'm super glad that I've now got access to that and maybe you'll see that Himalayan popping up more on my videos in the future. Let me know if that's something you'd want to see. Maybe I'll even try my hand at a bit of off-roading on it. So, I guess that's all for today. So, thanks for watching. Um, if you haven't done so already, I'd appreciate it if you would like and subscribe. If, of course, you liked it. And if, of course, you'd like to see more. I'm not going to force you into it. And um, do drop me a comment. Because one of the things I enjoy most about YouTube is the fact that I get to chat to people who I would otherwise probably never have met. Um, so, drop me a comment so we can chat in the comment section as well. 
So take it easy, have a nice day. If you're riding, ride safe, and I'll catch up with you later. Cheers. <laughs>